morning. My name is Anna Decknatel. I'm a second year law student here at Penn and one of the students who organized this event um, on behalf of Penn Law, the Toll Public Interest Center, and the Journal of Law and Social Change. I'd, I'd like to welcome you to the 32nd annual Edward V. Sparer uh, Symposium. Thank you all for joining us um, for what we hope is a timely conversation about immigration. Um, throughout the day, you're gonna hear from legal practitioners, scholars, immigrants, people who have dedicated their careers to immigrant and human rights and to reforming our immigration system. Um, first, I'd like to invite Dean Michael Fitz to say a few words of welcome. Dean Fitz has been a really uh, visionary leader here at Penn Law. In, in just the time that we've been uh, students here, we've seen the stunning new Golkin Hall take shape. Um, and Dean Fitz has ensured that as Penn Law has physically grown, um, its thriving public interest programs have uh, expanded as well. Penn Law now offers five postgraduate public interest fellowships to its students um, and provides greater loan repayment assistance to its graduates uh, than ever before. So we thank Dean Fitz for his ongoing support of the Sparrow Symposium, uh, of Public Interest Week, and of public interest programs uh, in general here at Penn. Um, uh, thank you, Anna, and I'm, I, uh, I think all of you may or may not know, but this symposium is organized by the uh, 2L um, Toll Scholars, which are just a phenomenal group, and um, if Ed Sparrow would hear, were here, he would be so proud of, of them and all they mean to the law school, and this conference, which um, they are really own and are behind, and I know we have scheduled by the end of the day, over 220 uh, participants in this conference. So it really is a testament to all that they've done. And I just want to sort of uh, publicly and then individually uh, note and cite uh, each one of them. And I, I wonder if they could, could stand. Anna, Anna Decknatel, um, uh, Elizabeth Freed, right, and uh, uh, Kara Hoff. Um, Okay, I'm Allison Hollenbeck, Lindsay Johnson, and Noel Leon. Anyway, can we give them a round? <laughs> now, I must say, ordinarily, I would uh, say a few words uh, about Ed Sparer, uh, but my colleague, uh, Howard Lesnick, who uh, was a good friend of Ed's, is going to uh, make those remarks. Um, but I, I just want to say, as many of you may know, uh, Ed Sparrow was one of the first public interest lawyers um, in, in the United States, and certainly on a, on a major law faculty, and had such an impact here at Penn, and I, I can't help but think he would be standing here just amazed at all the, all the different things uh, that have happened both here and nationally um, with the public interest movement uh, and in law schools. But um, I will defer to my colleague, um, who will uh, talk a little bit about Ed and what he's meant to this institution. I do want to say this symposium, which actually was started, it, it's the 32nd uh, anniversary of, of the symposium, though it's the 30th anniversary of when it was named after Ed, uh, Ed Sparrow because he tragically died um, uh, two years after it was started. But he, he would be just so overwhelmed by what's, what's happened over the last 30 years. This, this symposium really captures what Penn is about, um, one of the great research universities of the world, and at the same time is deeply engaged in the sort of the practical aspects of how, um, how change occurs and social justice. And today's symposium on immigration is a classic illustration of that. It's one of the most, clearly one of the most uh, important issues facing our nations, one of the most um, politically charged, and also an issue which is clearly going to um, change and uh, evolve, given what's going on in Washington uh, right now. And I really, once again, want to thank the Toll Scholars for having put all this together. Um, they've had such impact on the institution in general, but this is just one more manifestation of it. I also want to thank, again, the Journal of Law and Social Change. It's amazing. They already have the issue out uh, for um, today's symposium. It's really a testament to them, and they've done a phenomenal job. I also want to say that this symposium is really an example, uh, in one illustration, of all that's going on here at the law school um, 
in public interest more generally. Um, as many of you know, we were uh, the first uh, major law school uh, to require public service as part of uh, the commitment of our students. But what's particularly noteworthy is that um, over close to 80% of our students exceed that uh, commitment on their own. And it's really become part of the culture of the institution. Uh, we have over 100, uh, 140 uh, students over the summer funded through the law school working on, on public interest. And then of course we've just rolled out a, a really um, uh, first rank loan forgiveness program, which I, I think is second to none in the country, which will support students who graduate from the law school with um, debt burdens in pursuing public interest and literally uh, not having to pay their debt. So there are a lot of things going on, uh, but this conference I think uh, shows sort of the commitment of our student body uh, and this institution and excitement about um, public interest more generally. So again, I would like to thank um, all the organizers of this and moreover the participants, uh, which ultimately is going uh, to be over 200, which will mean we will move downstairs for the afternoon activities. Um, but welcome to you all. Thank you for coming uh, to the University of Pennsylvania. And thank Anna, who has uh, um, been one of the main organizers. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Fitz. Uh, thank you, Dean Fitz. Um, as he mentioned, we do also want to pause for a moment to remember Ed Sparrow, for whom today's events are named um, on the 30th anniversary of his passing. The legacy of his, of his work continues well beyond this event, um, and we do encourage you to read some information um, about him in the program. Professor Howard Lesnick, who is a, a public interest uh, institution here in his own right, um, has agreed to say a few words about his colleague. Um, by way of introduction, Pro Professor Lesnick is an expert on law and religion and on uh, legal ethics. Um, he's shaped Penn Law in a number of ways that I'm not gonna try and, and list, but um, one that uh, Dean Fitz did mention because of Professor Lesnick, every student graduates having, having done 75 hours at a minimum of pro bono service. It's a program that was pioneered here and is now a model for legal education around the country. Um, so thank you, for Professor Lesnick. <coughs> I first met Ed Sparer in the spring of 1967. Uh, there was a time when America seemed willing to struggle with the pain of rebirth. The seed planted by black soldiers in the war against the Axis powers and by the Supreme Court in the darkness of 1954 had been nurtured into turbulent, radiant growth by white Southern judges of the federal courts by Mrs. Rosa Parks and hundreds of black men and women sitting at lunch counters and marching to voter registration offices and to jail, and by the ministry of Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. Wisdom and challenge were found and welcomed in the songs around us, in the words of Lennon and McCartney, of Dylan, the world seemed wider than our fears. It was not to be. De Gaulle tottered, repaired to Germany, and returned triumphant. Bobby Kennedy gathered strength and hope and was assassinated. When I last saw Ed Sparer in the spring of 1983, America and the world had turned to its Reagans its Thatchers, its Bagans. It was part of Ed's genius that neither the crest of popular support and optimism nor the whirlpool of despair overcame his clarity of insight and purpose. Easy court victories, judicial responsiveness to the creative theories that he was so instrumental uh, in propounding as part of the welfare rights movement uh, and sympathetic newspaper interviews and articles never deluded Ed into thinking that the task was in any way uh, less far-reaching or controversial. Uh, and as rising tide of mean-spiritedness 
and legitimated greed left undamaged his central faith and hope. Central uh, to Ed's vision of America is a commitment to the unity of interest between the poor and those above them in the social order, to a commitment to the need to re-envision the interests of apparently dominant groups, white males and others, um, to transcend the polarity that between their interests and the elimination of status-based inequality. Uh, and a recognition that legal responses are an aspect of political responses, and that the justification for a career in law and for an excellent and humane legal education is in the extent to which lawyers serve human needs. I long ago lost the capacity to tell what in my own thinking I owe to Ed Sparer for so much of the evolution of my own work is a wrestling with themes articulated in his. He was a demanding friend and colleague, demanding intellectually, emotionally, and morally. Uh, but he demanded no less of himself than of others. Uh, and in struggling with the ongoing questions uh, of my own professional and personal life, no less than in seeking to develop my understanding of the world, much that I now think I know is tinged deeply with what I learned from Ed. As the dean said, he died suddenly uh, in his sleep at the age of 55, 30 years ago. With hundreds of others, I mourned his death. But what I have from our 16 years of association is not diminished by his death. With hundreds of others, I celebrate his life. Thank you so much, Professor Lesnick. Um, finally, I just want to echo the Dean in thanking the Journal of Law and Social Change. It's Penn's progressive legal journal focused on theoretical and practical writing on social justice topics. And as the Dean mentioned, for the second year in a row, the concurrent symposium issue is available today. So please feel free to pick up a free copy at the registration table. Um, Nikki Hurst Cook, who's JLASC's symposium editor, and all of the mem members of the journal really worked incredibly hard to make that happen, and, and we're really fortunate for the collaboration and, and thank them all for their work. Um, you'll also see that inside every issue is an insert that explains how you can stay in touch with the journal and how you can submit your writing. Uh, we really encourage uh, practitioners and scholars alike, um, and if you're interested, please do fill that out and, and drop that sheet at the registration table. Um, finally, I want to turn it over to Allison Hollenbeck for our first panel, uh, Where Are We Today? The State of Immigration Today. Thank you all. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Allison Hollenbeck, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our first panel. Where are we now, the state of immigration today? Once again, immigration is a hot topic. President Obama has said that comprehensive immigration reform is his top legislative priority for his second term, and he has put forward his own proposal for what reform should look like. A bipartisan group of senators have done the same and are currently working on drafting a bill to overhaul our immigration system, set to be released next month. Now, in both of these proposals, and in almost all of the articles written about them, 
one refrain is constant. Our immigration system is broken. Now, before we spend the rest of the day examining different pieces of this system and the ways they interact with one another, we first wanted to step back and provide a holistic overview of the system as it stands today. What does it mean that our immigration system is broken? How did it get broken? And what are the ways in which it is broken? And last, we'll touch on a question that our final panel today will focus on exclusively, how do we fix it? These are just some of the very simple, straightforward, and easy questions that our esteemed panelists have agreed to help us tackle today. So, joining us are two of the leading immigrant rights advocates in the nation. They have witnessed and shaped the evolution of our immigration system as it has taken on a number of different forms in recent years, and they have graciously agreed to share their unique insights, experience, and perspectives with us today. Next to me is Mary Meg McCarthy. She is the Executive Director of the National Immigrant Justice Center in Chicago, one of the leading immigrant advocacy organizations in the country. NIJC uses a multi-pronged approach to advance the rights of immigrants through direct service, impact litigation, and advocacy. Ms. McCarthy has been at NIJC for about 15 years, and under her leadership, the organization has increased its staff from eight to 40. Each year, it serves 10,000 non-citizens through its unparalleled pro bono attorney network of 1,000. She has testified before congressional committees on human rights and immigration detention reform and has received a number of awards for her leadership in her field. Next to her is Professor Lucas Gutentag. He is a distinguished law professor at Yale Law School and a lecturer in residence at Stanford Law School. He is one of the best strategic impact litigators in the country when it comes to advancing the rights of immigrants. He founded the Immigrants' Rights Project at the ACLU and then went on to lead the project for 25 years. At the ACU, ACLU, excuse me, he litigated complex civil rights, class actions, and constitutional cases in federal courts all across the country, including the Second and Ninth Circuits, as well as, I might add, successful arguments in front of the Supreme Court of the United States. He has repeatedly received the Outstanding Litigation Award from the American Immigration Lawyers Association. So with that, I'll turn it over to our panel. Uh, Professor Gutentag, before we discuss the system that we have today, would you mind giving us a little history of the system? How did we get here? How did the system get broken? Okay, well, so thank you very much. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Uh, Dean Fitz, thank you. It's an honor to be uh, at Penn Law School. Um, and now I'm supposed to give you a history of the world of immigration in five minutes or less. Uh, so let, let me at least start. Uh, and, and like any complex you know, phenomenon, it's kind of arbitrary where you start. Uh, and what you focus on. So this is uh, a somewhat arbitrary uh, view of how I think we ended up uh, where we are today. And we could pick almost any point in American history, uh, but let me just say briefly that to be part of what we experience today is based on reforms that were actually enacted in 1965 through 1976, because what happened then was we created the modern uh, immigration system, which got rid of the old national origins quota system, which was designed expressly to preserve the ethnic makeup of the United States as it existed in 1890, a, a plainly and blatantly and admittedly racist uh, system of immigration that favored Western Europeans over everybody else. Uh, and in 1965, as part of the civil rights movement, uh, that got changed. And between 65 and 76, we set up uh, the contemporary system, which was designed to be more fair, and it is, but at the same time, we imposed restrictions on Mexican immigration uh, in ways that had not existed uh, before 1965 and 1976. So part of the beginnings of what we see is the quest for equalization also imposed restrictions on Mexican migration that had not existed uh, before. And that began the process of it wasn't the only thing, but it was began part of the process of creating the dynamic of illegal immigration uh, from Mexico. By 1986, 
there was the last big effort at legalization and at reform. Uh, at that point, it was estimated that there were some three to five, uh, five million uh, undocumented immigrants uh, in the United States. So the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act, the IRCA, was passed, and it had uh, what, you'll, what we recognize as three very familiar themes. Discourage new illegal immigration by denying employment uh, to immigrants who are not authorized to be here. Enforce the border to stop new illegal immigrants from coming. And provide a legalization path for those who are undocumented and already here. Right. So legalization, employer sanctions, border control. Exactly the same themes that we hear uh, today. Well, what happened in 86 is we, did, we had a legalization program, and it did legalize some roughly 3 million people or so, um, but it was flawed in many respects. Uh, and part of what we see today is the consequences of that as well. Many people did not qualify. The system, the system for legalization was very complicated. A person had to be here at least five years, excuse me, only people who had entered more than five years before the law was passed, the only people who were undocumented in the United States in 1980, by 1982 were eligible to legalize in 1986, so already there was a huge cohort of people who didn't qualify. There were very complicated eligibility rules, so it didn't by any means legalize everyone, and many people uh, were left out. Employer sanctions were adopted, the, so the I-9 form that you've probably all filled out uh, that's supposed to verify employment, uh, that hasn't worked. It's caused discrimination uh, instead, and the border buildup began. Uh, then, fast forward another 10 years to 1996, and what we see is essentially many of the harshest measures that exist in the law today were adopted in 1996, the so-called Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, or IRA-IRA, uh, we immigration lawyers like to call it. Um, so this was the harshest immigration set of laws that anyone in our generation had ever seen. And it established essentially the mechanisms that today deprive many, many people of an opportunity to gain legal status that existed in the past. So just to give you a few uh, examples, the whole uh, concept of criminal immigration, the harsh consequences uh, of criminal convictions didn't start in 1996, but was accelerated enormously. Legal permanent residents, <coughs> excuse me, with old convictions were subject to retroactive deportation grounds. All the kind of forms of individualized consideration of a person's equities to claim for to stay based on longstanding ties in the United States was largely. Uh, eliminated the new detention system that we have today, massive detention, lengthy detention, mandatory detention, was largely enacted uh, in 1996. Efforts to strip the courts of jurisdiction to hear immigration removal cases, the case that I argue in the Supreme Court, was enacted, were enacted uh, in 1996. Prohibitions on people gaining legal status even if they're married to United States citizens, if they've been here in undocumented status for more than a year, as a practical matter, they're afraid to apply for legal status because of bars that would compel them to leave the United States for 10 years. All the measures that essentially took the flexibility out of the system uh, were enacted in 1996 or made harsher in 1996. So that's contributed to the so-called broken system and to uh, the undocumented population uh, that we have today. And then in addition, increased border enforcement again uh, in 1996. So we see the continual buildup of the border and the border enforcement from 86, 96, and then 9-11. Uh, and 9-11 actually, interestingly, uh, I think did not so much change the law as change attitudes or harshen attitudes, and secondly, lead to enormous resources, money, being poured into the immigration enforcement system. And the border today is very much a reflection of the resources that were expended after 9-11. Enormous defensing, the criminal prosecution of people at the border, 
the effect of funneling crossings away from Texas and urban areas in California into the harshest parts of the border, the desert, and then particularly Arizona, which we can talk about what that did uh, for Arizona, but this increasing uh, border enforcement, funneling of people away uh, from urban areas into and across the deserts has led to thousands and thousands of deaths of people trying uh, to cross. And then, ironically, having the effect of deterring and preventing traditional patterns of circular migration. We had a mechanism or a system, a de facto system, really, if you will, because it was de facto, um, of per people coming to the United States. This is principally for Mexico. It's obviously not the only undocumented population. 80% of the undocumented population today, 60% is Mexican. And if you add Central Americans, it takes, that's 80% of the undocumented population. There are, of course, many others. But the traditional pattern of migration uh, for Mexico is people came, worked, left during the holidays, left to see their family. So you had circular migration. As a result of the border buildup, that stopped, essentially, or large, significantly decreased. And so people who traditionally came and left stayed. And as they stayed, their families came. And as their families came, they settled. And as the cost of crossing became higher, the need to stay longer increased. So the, the demographers who've studied this, Jeff Passell, Doug Massey, and others, can document that the consequence of the border buildup has largely been to lock people in more than to keep people out. So that, too, contributed to the undocumented population, along with the uh, elimination of avenues for relief uh, and avenues for uh, gaining legal status. So that's a kind of a quick tour of what led us to the circumstance within the economic crisis, obviously, the effort, the failed effort at legislation uh, in 2006 and 2007, and then the amazing social movement of the Dreamers, the political mobilization that happened uh, beginning in the mid-2000s, 2006, 2007, the obvious political dynamics and change and the recognition of the empowerment of Latino and Asian voters, the consequences of this last election, all of that together has brought us, in my view, to where we are today including significantly, and I think we'll talk about this maybe a little more in the next panel, the Supreme Court decision in the Arizona versus United States case. Um, so uh, let, me, let me stop there uh, as a uh, 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 one person's tour through uh, the last uh, 40 or 50 years uh, of, uh, of immigration legislation and change. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, now, Ms. McCarthy. Um, I'd love to hear how the laws that Professor Gutentag has just laid out for us have affected the people that come into your organization as the director of an organization that interacts with our immigration system from a number of different angles. Um, and what are the most important ways, in your opinion, that the system is broken? old depressing thing and it's really um, as I think Professor Lesnick mentioned in his remarks about Professor Spar. An interesting time politically and what's the legal response? How, how do we as a legal community respond to, to this moment? And um, I, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, as Allison mentioned, we represent immigrants, refugees and asylum seekers, about 10,000 a year. Um, and these are immigrant families, these are unaccompanied immigrant children, um, victims of trafficking, uh, domestic violence, other crimes, detained individuals, um, and it, this whole range of individuals that we see coming into our office really informs our litigation and, and advocacy work. Um, and, and how we see the law actually being implemented in practice. What I want to focus on today and how the system is broken in three major ways following what um, Luke has mentioned is this idea that there's a lie. Um, the reality of the school. Sorry. Does that work? Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, the reality is um, 
this idea of the line is that there is no line for people. Um, people are, um, came here, as Professor Gutentag mentioned, to work. In the, in the 1980s and 90s, it was a booming time in our economy. And we saw people coming in, there were jobs. So we had millions of people coming in, and now we have 11 million undocumented people. And those people who came in to work were more than happy to get into a line. But there was no line. There were only approximately 122 visas, more or less, for workers at that time. So as Professor Gutentag said, they stayed. And they had families. So today we have about 60% of the undocumented population who've been here for more than 10 years. So in that time period, we've seen this explosion of individuals who have families and are now engaged in this horrendous, or pulled and trapped into this horrendous enforcement and detention system, which is the second point I want to talk about. So the first point, no line. What is going on in the detention enforcement system? And thirdly, this whole lack of review and meaningful access to a court system. So, as I mentioned, we had all these people coming into the country. Now, they're trying to become legal, and there's no one. We have no visas for them. There are no family petitions right now. If you petition through a family member, some of these cases, they wait decades. The, these people will be dead before there's a visa available for them. Currently, there are four to five U.S. citizen children that have at least one undocumented parent. Since July of 2010, Department of Homeland Security has deported more than 205,000 parents of USC children, and 5,000 children are currently in our foster care system. Let me give you an example of a case that we represented. Um, two stellar high school students about two years ago graduated from high school, a suburban high school in Chicago, were traveling to Harvard to visit their um, classmates who had graduated um, on the Amtrak, and they got stopped. And they were questioned by the authorities as to whether or not they were U.S. citizens. And lo and behold, they honestly said, no, we're not. We Excuse came over when we were 12 years old as Mexicans. Excuse me, Ms. Krepp, could you just speak up a little oh, bit? I sure. think we're having a, little, a hard time hearing you in the back. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Thank you. So these young men um, have been brought over by their parents, and um, the parents were hardworking individuals, and they got stopped. They were placed in a detention facility. Um, they luckily, were able to contact their parents. Their parents contacted their high school counselors, and they contacted us in turn. We were eventually able to get them released. Now, this is before we had what happened this past summer, um, DACA, Deferred Action for these young people. So these two stellar students who you know, spoke perfect English were now being deported. Um, we immediately you know, got involved, represented them in court, and were able to get prosecutorial discretion in those two cases after extensive work. But, those two young men, as well as their family and their parents, are incredibly contributing members of our community. And there was no legal relief for these individuals. And they're the individuals that we want in this country. There was nothing for them. But what happened to them is that they got caught up in this second broken part of the system, in this horrendous enforcement detention system. And as Lucas mentioned, the 1996 laws regarding enforcement and detention were extremely harsh. I mean, th these young men were in mandatory detention, and it took a lot of work to get them out. And what we've seen, as Lucas mentioned, is a real environmental shift to our enforcement and detention system post 9-11. And we've seen this massive detention and deportation of not only undocumented workers, but also long-term long -term residents who pose no threat to our security. As Lucas mentioned, the 1996 laws retroactively impacted individuals. So a long-term resident who'd been here for 25 years had a conviction for a marijuana possession in, you know, 30, 35 years ago, leaves to go visit a sick, ailing mother to Mexico 
and comes back and finds that he's now in immigration proceedings. This case was an amazing case because the man got out of detention and so was continuing to live and work in the United States while going through immigration proceedings. But this ailing mother family member um, was dying. So he went back to Mexico, assuming that he was fine to go back to Mexico. And he was coming back for his hearing and the Border Patrol would not let him in. So guess what? He got an in absentia order in the immigration court. So then he gets back in, not knowing this in absentia order had been entered, and now he's charged, as Lucas mentioned, for illegal reentry, and he's put into the criminal prosecution system. This is a case we found out about through a criminal defense attorney who called us and said, what can I do? Um, and so we were successful in getting his case reopened with the immigration court, and now we're pursuing relief for him in the immigration court. But the system is so broken, and there are thousands of people who get caught up in this. Um, and you'll hear more about this in the next panel, but what's happened over the years is that we've seen more collaboration with local law enforcement. So we have the local police and sheriff department implementing immigration laws, which is in effect undermining safeties in our, safety in our community. Individuals who get stopped for simple traffic tickets, speeding, are now finding themselves in immigration proceedings and detention and locked up and being deported. The interior enforcement has expanded dramatically over the past eight or 10 years. The detention system has doubled from 200,000 individuals annual, annually in the year 2000 to 400,000 in 2012. Individuals are detained in a patchwork of jails, 250 county private prison jails. Um, many of them are ill-equipped to house long-term detainees, resulting in inhumane conditions. We just did a report on solitary confinement being used in the immigration detention system. This is civil detention. This is not criminal. This is not supposed to be detention that punishes an individual. The cost to this, as Lucas mentioned is astronomical. It's $164 a day to detain my two high school student graduates. It's the cost of the immigration enforcement and detention apparatus. A study done by Immigration Policy Institute this past spring indicated that we spent $18 billion last year on immigration enforcement and detention. That is more than any other federal agency combined spends in their enforcement efforts. That's including Department of uh, Drug Enforcement Agency and the FBI. But what happens when people get trapped in this system? There's a complete lack of review. 65% of the individuals who are deported have no hearings, have no access to a judge. We've worked with the um, National Immigration Law Center in a, in a study, and we've done some Freedom of Information Act requests, and they did a great report looking how people sign away their rights while they're detained, not knowing what they're signing. We had a case in Florida with a client who, he, he was 20 years old, detained. He'd been here for 15 years. He got locked up didn't have access to a counsel because immigrants don't have appointed counsel to him. He got locked up, and the immigration officer said, here, you can go home, just sign this piece of paper. You can go back to Mexico. He signs the piece of paper. He comes back in to be with his child. He then gets caught for illegal reentry. We looked at the case, and we realized this kid had relief. There was a case here. He could have gotten immigration relief. He had no one advising him as to his legal rights. And now he was not only being facing permanent banishment from the United States, but also jail time, criminal prosecution, because of the illegal reentry. We're now in the process of litigating this case, saying he signed this removal order, but he did not knowingly waive his rights to an immigration court hearing. So what we have is a perfect storm of the brokenness of our current system. We have a vast number of individuals 
who are undocumented and have no way to become documented. We have a system that punishes a long-term resident who is contributing to our economy and culture by indefinitely detaining and permanently deporting them. And then we have no in way for individuals trapped in the system to have any human civil and due process rights through our court system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McCarthy, for that very thorough and fascinating overview of our system. I'm going to turn to our last question for you two right now. Um, now that you've both laid out for us the biggest problems with the system and how we've gotten here, um, I'd really like to hear what you'd most like to see in comprehensive immigration reform. How do we fix the system? And if, Professor, if you could get us started off, that would be fantastic. <clears throat> okay, so um, there's obviously a lot that needs to be fixed. And what Mary Meg was just saying is we need a functional system. Uh, we need to restore uh, due process. Um, but let me uh, focus maybe for a moment on the so-called legalization uh, scheme or system because that's really front and center in terms of uh, what's being talked about. I would, I would say, you know, overall, legalization, uh, dealing with future immigration, and fundamental fairness are the three essential components uh, to having a fair and functioning immigration system. So as to legalization, the challenge here is to do something to provide uh, a path to permanent, enduring legal status and citizenship for undocumented people in the United States. Then we have to have a fair system uh, going forward, and we have to be realistic that there are going to continue to be undocumented people in the United States in the future. I think it's a huge mistake to think about fixing the immigration system as a one-time, we'll do it all and we'll be done with it uh, kind of solution. That's what informed 1986. That's what didn't work then, and it won't work now. Migration is a human dynamic that's informed by many, many factors, and it's not changed by changing legal regimes. So we have to have a legal system that recognizes that. Okay, so but let me go to legalization. I would say legalization, the key components of legalization, I would say one is having a broad, having broad eligibility. If and when legalization is enacted, it needs to really encompass the undocumented population that's in the United States today. That means not leaving people out, not doing something like was done in 1986, saying you're eligible only if you arrived five years ago or eight years ago or 10 years ago. It needs to deal with people who are here now. So broad eligibility in terms of uh, when the person uh, needs to have arrived. Secondly, it needs to be simple and straightforward. The, the eligibility criteria have to be simple. The application process has to be simple. Uh, the implementation of the system has to be simple so that people not only are technically eligible, but are actually able to apply and able to pursue uh, the status uh, to which they're eligible. That also means the cost has to be low. It, it's not going to work if the cost is high if there's enormous penalties for back taxes that have to be paid up front, there, there can't be economic barriers to people pursuing uh, their, the application. Um, there needs to, we, we need to, we, oh, we, the, the, the application uh, date and period can't be short and arbitrary. Again, looking back to what happened in 1986, the application period was one year long, which sounds good in the abstract. In practice, it was a disaster. Uh, and what it meant was that many people did not apply during the one-year cutoff application period. And also, the process of implementing the application system was disputed. There were interpretations about who was eligible and who wasn't part of the lack of simplicity. And many people waited to get resolution of what the criteria were, didn't apply, or were discouraged from applying, or were told, don't apply because you may not be eligible. Then the cutoff date came, and people were left out forever. So we need an application period that's long and that's flexible and that allows people to apply uh, for an extended period of time, and it doesn't have an absolute and categorical and harsh uh, um, cutoff date. 
Um, next, the grounds of ineligibility, uh, there, there can't be harsh grounds of ineligibility. And where this is probably going to be the most contested is with regard to past criminal convictions. The question is going to be whether someone who's here undocumented, who has committed some kind of crime, is prohibited from applying for legalization even if they've been here for a long time, even if they have uh, long-standing ties to the United States, even if they have U.S. citizen kids, whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> and that's going to have appealing sound bites. You know, why should we allow a criminal to legalize? But it means that many people will be left out because the criminal grounds of ineligibility are incredibly sweeping, incredibly broad, uh, and incredibly categorical. So what Mary Meg was saying, an old conviction, a drug offense, a DUI, all sorts of prior criminal convictions can be grounds of ineligibility. So in terms of looking at a legalization program, the criminal grounds of ineligibility, if they're imposed at all, need to be ones that can be looked at on an individualized basis. In other words, the nature of the conviction, the length of time ago, the person's rehabilitation since. So there shouldn't be categorical prohibitions based on past criminal convictions. Um, so that's another uh, aspect of it. Um, and then um, I would say uh, maybe lastly is that uh, it's very important that there be judicial oversight over the implementation process that the federal courts need to be in a position to supervise what DHS does with regard to implementation, both in terms of reviewing individual cases and denials, and secondly, having review of the system of implementation. If the rules, the regulations are unfair, are not consistent with the statute, are arbitrary, deny due process, the courts have to be in a position uh, to review that. Um, and then ultimately and obviously critically, there needs to be a real, true, and fast path to citizenship for people who are eligible uh, to legalize. Great. And um, <clears throat> let me just talk about the fair, fundamental fairness component <clears throat> excuse me, that um, Lucas mentioned. We have a number of ideas and thoughts, and um, on your table is a list of a document called Principles and Priorities, which includes some of these. But first of all, I think we have to really rethink this enforcement detention apparatus. Um, there are things that can be done legislatively as well as administratively that we don't have the a ridiculous number of people caught into the system. Um, first of all, we can look at what's called alternatives to detention. People do not have to be detained in a detention center. We do that in the criminal justice system. We need to look at that in the immigration system. One, we have to expand who's eligible for bonds. Individuals in the immigration system, it's very limited who's eligible for a bond. Third, we need to look at what's called this detention bed quota. I don't know how many have paid attention, but yesterday there was a hearing in the House of Representatives talking about this detention bed quota. There's an appropriation bill that says we are appropriating, allocating 30, money for 34,000 beds a day. Congress and ICE is interpreting that to mean you have to fill 34,000 beds a day. That's not how that should be interpreted. Um, and we need to clarify that. We need to look at who should fall under this mandatory detention category. We've expanded, as Lucas mentioned, the, the list of crimes that require individuals to, fall, to be subjected to mandatory detention. That includes shoplifting. We have mothers who have shoplifted to feed their children. Those individuals shouldn't be subjected to mandatory detention. We need to rethink what crimes result in individuals having to be locked up. We need to look at access to counsel. We have that in the criminal justice system. This next week's the 100th anniversary of the Gideon decision. The 
result of immigrants being deported is punishment. It's permanent banishment from this country, permanent separation from their families. Access to counsel is critical. Without it, it's impossible for most people to navigate the system. Even immigration attorneys often are trying to figure out the different regulations in the statute and the policies and the practices. We're hopeful with what's coming up, and I think there'll be more discussion, that at least we'll begin to chip away at the access to counsel component for unaccompanied immigrant children and individuals who have mental health conditions. And hopefully we can move forward from there. Hearings. Individuals have to have access to hearings. An immigration hearing is critical. The streamlined deportation in which an immigration officer who's neither a judge or a lawyer makes a decision as to whether that individual should remain in the country is so contrary to our fundamental principles of fairness and justice that it has to end. We need to look at how we revamp the system so that all individuals have a hearing and that those individuals also can appeal to the federal court system. But let me go back to the immigration court. And Lucas mentioned this and what happened in 1996. We have to restore the immigration judge's discretion. We have totally removed that from their authority and power through the statutes. Immigration judges see the individual hear their stories, know what the equities are. Right now, there's a blanket deportation. They have no ability to take those equities into consideration. There's a lot that can be done to fix this system. And all of you here, I hope, will become involved and engaged in it. As we know, the people who live with us, our neighbors, have made incredible contributions. And if we don't change the system now, we're just going to perpetuate what is currently a two-tiered system of justice, one for citizens and the other for non-citizens. Thank you. Thank you both so much for that incredible review. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>